We have uh, Congressman Kevin Kramer on the program. Uh, Congressman, I, I, I know you love music. As a matter of fact, you were at the North Dakota Music Awards. Did I, did I read that correctly? <laughs> yes, I was. Yes. Yeah. I was um, able to present the award for uh, favorite uh, Christian artist. Oh, well, that's great. Yeah, that's wonderful. Joe Schmidt. Yeah, it was really cool. Do you, uh, I, later, actually after you, I'm going to have a uh, forum columnist, Ryan Johnson, on. He had a column up about uh, best 90s albums, which, of course, speaks to me because that was sort of my my teen years. You know, mm -hmm. high school years was in the 90s, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of albums. Sure. And uh, a lot of those albums from that era are now turning, like, 20 years old, right? Sure. Sort of like, which makes me feel really old. Yeah. Um, do you have a favorite 90s album? I mean, is that an era you paid particular attention to or? No, I, I will be honest. By the '90s, I was pretty well into contemporary Christian music, and still am. Um, however, f in terms of sort of popular music, my era was the '70s, and so groups like Styx, um, acts like uh, Elton John, even Jim Croce in my in the early '70s, going that far back. But th those were the acts I liked. But I grew to love like B.J. Thomas is one of my absolute favorites, who's become a friend now in in this new life of mine. It's just kind of remarkable. Um, Neil. Uh, uh, Neil Diamond is just probably my very favorite of all artists. So yeah, I'm I'm a fair bit uh, <laughs> ahead of you or behind, whichever way you look at. It. We uh yeah, well it's it's music's always fun to talk about. It is, it's awesome. My uh my my daughter, I was I was telling the I I tried to get the attorney general to give me a favorite song, and I I think I surprised him, and then he didn't he didn't he, he's in the, he's in the middle of a campaign cycle though, so he probably yeah he can't run pick a, favorites. I, yeah. As you know, I didn't seek a position of influence to be neutral on anything so yeah. I, well, <laughs> I tend to just tell it how i yeah. feel it uh, but neil diamond's hot august nights probably my favorite album of all time and neil diamond's great the only thing i don't like about neil they always play a song at the uh, at red sox games which yep. kind of puts my teeth on edge a little bit as a, as a sweet young caroline it's yeah, probably right. the most popular song at uh, stadiums around the around the country it's a great song yeah. i i play it secretly just don't tell my, my fellow <laughs> Yankee, yankees fans. Keep, keep it between us yeah <laughs> us us and and the, the listening audience and speaking of which, we should get to uh, the interview. You had a straw poll because uh, North Dakota didn't have a primary or a caucus uh, for, I, I guess, Republicans in the state to, to, to speak out about who, who they might want their, their nominee to be for president. You held a straw poll. Donald Trump won. T tell us about it. The, the sure. process. How how did the idea come to be? How did the voting go? Tell us all about it. Well, let me go way back because when I was tourism director, and, and re remembering I had been the state party Republican Party chairman prior to that, and Ed Schaefer became governor, and I became tourism director, and I, it always bothered me as a political activist that that New Hampshire and um, Iowa got to choose the Republican nominee for president. And I just I said, why them? Now I will say, Rob, I've grown to appreciate their role in it a lot more because they are sort of wonderful laboratories for, um, you know, for, for even a, sort of a rural sense, if you will, and a, a common sense, but more than anything, a retail political, um, you know, political experiment. That said, it still bothered me that they had so much to say and we had so little because our primary is in June. And I don't even remember a presidential campaign going to June because the process of elimination took place uh, as a result of momentum. I would say momentum leads to inevitability in politics, and I think that's what we're experiencing now. So I, I, when I was tourism director, I, I uh, learned that, that – my friend uh, Andy Maragos, uh, the representative from Minot, had an interest in an early primary. And so I used my tourism post uh, along with him to push for, and we passed a, a primary, presidential primary date for the one week after New Hampshire. And that was an experiment in 19, I want to say it was 96. And we had many. Um, presidential candidates visit North Dakota, their spouses. Um, some of them made multiple visits, and it was very active, and, and broadcasters supported it, and, and newspapers, of course. Well, after that, it, you know, there's some expense, obviously, to running a, a primary election, and there was plenty of opposition from people who are in the uh, public service of, of, of conducting uh, elections. So they went to more of a caucus, and, and, and the state parties could run their own caucuses, and they did for, for a number of election cycles. And this year, for various reasons, not the least of which is we had a change in leadership at the party that made it difficult for the timeline and the new RNC rules and the binding of, of delegates and all that, just made it difficult for our state party to 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 conduct the caucus. So I said, you know what, I'm going to have fun with this. I'm going to provide an opportunity for North Dakotans to participate in an online straw poll. I, I 
checked with the RNC, the, that's the Republican National Committee and the state party, to make sure I didn't do anything that would violate their rules or that would somehow make it difficult for our delegates to be seated at the national convention. And so by doing it online and by, by conducting it over a, a number of days or weeks as opposed to, you know, say a singular day, I was able to do that. And, and so I did it as much as anything to have some fun. Secondly, to test the voters and just see where, where they really are and and realizing that it's not a caucus, realizing it's not a primary, but, Rob, also realizing that it has as much integrity as we could put into it. And by that I mean we required people to, to put put in their name, of course, a, a um, email address and then uh, a zip code of their home address. And, and that allows us to verify that people are North Dakotans. And we didn't verify every name, but we did enough checking to, you know, spot checking to make sure that these were North Dakotans. The fact that they fill it out, there's a disclaimer that requires them, or, or it states that they intend to vote Republican, which is, it, it, it's, it's more than you do if you go to the, you know, primary uh, voting booth, because in North Dakota, we don't have voter registration. You get the same ballot, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, and you fill out whichever side, you know, you want to, and that, that, that indicates your preference. So I thought we did it with as much integrity as we could, and uh, we also went in and de-duped. You know, anybody that tried to vote more than once, we, uh, you know, we narrowed it down to just one vote. We didn't let them have more than one vote. And and that's what that's what we did. I, I was intending to to run it through Super Tuesday, but really it was such a dynamic race, people dropping out, narrowing of the field. I said, hey, let's keep it open one more week. And then, Rob, that serves as a couple of things. One, it's fun. You know, it, it allows people to have a say, especially in a year like this where it's never been so um, dynamic, uh, the presidential preference process. Secondly, you know, to involve people in the process. I think that that's what parties ought to do. They ought to facilitate activism. And um, and then thirdly, to provide some instruction as to who I might want to support. And um, while I have my own feelings, um, you know, I am the only representative in the House from North Dakota, and I thought it would be instructive to see what the people had to say. And I think we had a pretty good process. Yeah, you, you a little under 5,000 voted. Is that what I understood? That's correct, yeah. Yeah. 4,740. Uh, yeah, okay, 4,740. And uh, Donald Trump won uh, by by a pretty wide margin, uh, given, given the number of candidates in the race. Mm-hmm. What do you think of the man? Because what what, you, what your reaction in the media, so, sort of what I heard on on the blog for people, mm-hmm. is that you were kind of saying, well, you know, that the party should should back Trump, but they're kind of saying that that you're kind of trying to do an endorsement without really endorsing, and which is which is unusual for you because normally we have no trouble getting at what Ke- what's on Kevin Kramer's <laughs> mind. Yeah. So what what's what's up with Trump? I mean, why so, why why are you kind of on the fence? It seems well. First of all, with regard to a, an official endorsement from a member of Congress, and, and I've always endorsed early, it, frankly. I, yeah, as you know, I was state I was the state chairman for Rudy Giuliani, and he had all the persistence. He, he had the Florida strategy, if you remember. Remember, he was he, yeah, was gonna he, was, he wasn't going to do anything until Florida. Well, you know, yeah. momentum went against him. You just you have to win early to still be viable, and, and by the time you get to Florida. But anyway, that said, Rob, I um. I don't, you know, no one's asked me for an endorsement. Donald Trump didn't ask me for an endorsement. I wouldn't have endorsed him at any point up to now. Um, but And I wouldn't endorse him without him asking because he might not want it. It's worked pretty well for him to not have endorsements of members of Congress in case we hadn't noticed. Um, so there's that issue. There's also um, – my, my fundamental point is is that I will support – the Republican nominee. And what I wanted to say and what I'm trying to convey to Republicans about Donald Trump is, well, he might not have been your first choice, and he wouldn't have been mine, Rob. He wouldn't have been my first four or five choices, probably. He is going to be our nominee. I believe that. He won my straw poll. That's as unscientific as it might be. It's, it's, I think it's every bit as credible as, as any caucus for sure is, and probably a primary. Um, and and he won it with, con- consistent with what's happening in other states in the country uh, and what's happening nationally. So he won it there, and, and I just I just see him as the inevitable nominee. And rather than – and what I'm trying to speak to here is that rather than having party leadership trying to find a way to stop him no matter what, and to the point of trotting out uh, Mitt Romney to criticize him as though – that is going to help. I mean, it, it shows a tone deafness that is mind-boggling to me. I'm saying 
stop the nonsense and help him be successful. Help him. And when I say successful, I don't mean just help him win the nomination. I mean help him be a successful general election candidate and help him be a successful president. Because I think Donald Trump's got some skills and some gifts that are better than, than some people are giving him credit for. He's also said some pretty awful things, wouldn't you agree? I would absolutely agree. I, I don't understand that tactic as well as it's worked for him. It's con- I, I shouldn't say I don't understand it. I understand what he's tapped into. And some of the awful things he says are, are, have actually helped him to some degree. I also think, though, he's been somewhat mis characterized. For example, let's, let's take the, the pause on, on Muslim in, in, uh, immigration. I didn't agree with that, and I was pretty critical of him in, in the Hill, um, if, if anybody saw that. But I also know that he didn't call for a ban on Muslims. He didn't say we should deport Muslims, but he did say we should have a pause until we understand this issue better. It was never portrayed that way. Um, with, you know, I had very grave concerns about what he, his reluctance to um, denounce uh, David Duke and the KKK, because when I was chairman of the Republican Party, uh, David Duke was a candidate for president and wanted to speak at our state convention. I said, you wouldn't be welcome. And I took some criticism for that, by the way, because I was speaking on behalf of an entire party of people, but I felt that wasn't, you know, he didn't share our values, yeah, and I didn't want him. That doesn't seem like a controversial thing to me, uh, but... Yeah, I know, but there, there actually were. There was actually. I remember a letter to the editor that said, hey, "Wait a minute, who are you to say which Republican running for president doesn't get to come to our convention?" I said, "Well, I, thought, well, I, I think this one's fairly clear cut." That said, Rob, when I actually watched what, what Donald Trump had to say, and he did denounce David Duke. He denounced him, be, denounced him before this episode. That he had denounced him since this episode. But all the focus was on this one episode where he he seemed like he had never heard of David Duke, and I. And, and white supremacy, and I could understand that, it, being a, having been a candidate and being a candidate, uh, not even imagining what those guys go through and, and doing as much as they do in the course of a day that he might have been confused about what he's talking about. But that said, it, it, yeah, do, do those things concern me? They do concern me. But I also believe he's going to be the Republican nominee, and, and I think he's got some gifts and he's got some ability as a business successful business person to surround himself with good people, to look to those of us in Congress that have an expertise in a particular field for guidance. You know, one of the strengths of Donald Trump is that he does keep it pretty simple. And one of the weaknesses, I think, especially of the senators and governors that have been running is they don't. They, have, they, they like detail. They give a lot of detail. They talk a different language than, than, than the general public. And because of all that detail, people are left sort of scratching their heads and, and – uh, I think Donald Trump's the kind of guy that'll turn to a Paul Ryan and say, you know, I've talked a lot about tax reform, um, and you know I want a simpler, more competitive tax policy, but I'm not the expert at it. Yeah. Can you help me? And Ronald Reagan did that, you know, yeah. so. Well, it, it, do you, do you, and, and I, I am way over, and I've, I've got to yeah, take a I break. Understand. Last, last question, though. Sure. If, if Trump, if Trump asked, would you endorse him? I mean, if he said, Kevin, I, I want your endorsement, would you, would you give it to him? You know, I, the reason I won't answer that to you is because I, I would want to reserve my first answer to that question for him, just out of fairness. Uh, and uh, that may sound somewhat evasive, but um, I think it's pretty clear that I, I'm, at the very least, I don't share the, the level of concern or panic that some of our party leaders do about him and, frankly, think that continuing to try to stop him at all costs. That's not to say you shouldn't continue with three other candidates to do what you want to support them and encourage them. But um, any sort of organized attempt at stopping Donald Trump, I think it would be more devastating to our party um, than anything Donald Trump is going to do to it. Kevin, thanks for your time. Appreciate Always it. Always a pleasure, man. Thank you. Congressman Kevin Kramer, Rob Port in for Jay Thomas, 701-293-9000, 888-970-9329. More to come straight ahead. Don't go away.